Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. This is going to be in English, and my introduction is going to be in English as well. Thank you for being here this afternoon. Uh, it's a, a great pleasure to be introducing uh, today's speaker, and I will briefly uh, take the opportunity to um, show you um, a video, a, a, a short extract of a video that depicts the, the Baghdad Modern Art Center. If you lower the, the sound, yeah. The Modern Art Center in Baghdad. This was uh, an object in our exhibition. It's a very important, one of the key uh, pieces of the study that uh, Patricia Rosas uh, uh, and myself uh, researched for the exhibition about uh, uh, the Iraqi uh, in, in enterprise of the foundation. And the reason why I wanted to show you this, this extract of the video is for on the one hand, because many of the visitors of the exhibition kind of miss this piece because it's outside of the, of the room and it's a very interesting piece. And on the other hand, it's because of its relevance. It was the way that we managed to see this building today. The building was built by the foundation it was important at the time, but we studying the archive could not really get a, a, a grasp of the, the reality of the building until uh, a German artist went to Baghdad to do a, an artistic project and she contacted us and, she, uh, and we eventually uh, finally showed a piece of her work in the exhibition. And this uh, is relevant today for the, the lecture today because this is a living example of heritage of the modern movement in Baghdad that has been kept alive. Throughout the vicissitudes, the, the, the very, very convoluted history of recent time Iraq since 2003, uh, this building has survived all these decades. It was opened in 1962 and it's still in use. And it has been recently refurbished. We see uh, uh, some, some, some of the interior here, and we've seen before the exterior of, of the building uh, within a very, very conflicted and still very problematic and slightly chaotic part of the city. Uh, uh, this building has been kept as a sort of uh, chest, treasure chest of Iraqi modern art. If you want to learn more about the building and Iraqi modern art, you should visit the exhibition. And I will just, I just use this example as something that has very, a very strong link with, with what Georges Arbid will be talking about today, which is the question of the heritage of the modern movement in the Middle East, so in, 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 in the Arab world. Um, and I will uh, now introduce to you Georges Arbid, who is an architect uh, uh, from Lebanon. Uh, George Arzbid is an architect and associate professor of architecture at the American University of Beirut. He received his Doctor of Design degree from Harvard University College, uh, I'm sorry, Harvard University Graduate School of Design, and his Diplôme d'études supérieures en architecture from the Académie Libanaise des Beaux-Arts. Prior to his stay, uh, at Harvard, he was a Fulbright visiting scholar at the History, Theory and Criticism program at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. His area of interest covers mostly modern architecture in Lebanon and the region. Among his writings is Beirut, the Phoenix and the Reconstruction Predicament, an, er an essay that he wrote for urbanization and the changing character of the Arab city published by uh, ESCWA in 2005. He's also the author of the forthcoming book, Carol Shire, Architect, a Poll in Beirut. Arbit is the co-founder and current director, and in this capacity he's uh, coming here today, of uh, the Arab uh, Center for Architecture located in Beirut, and the founding member of Docomomo Lebanon. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Docomomo is an international organization devoted to uh, the documentation and uh, uh, raising awareness of uh, the heritage of modern movement uh, worldwide. 
uh, modern movement architecture, obviously, worldwide. Uh, he's published Architecture Practice, which is also uh, another side of his activity, includes the Shab and Salem residences, the latter having uh, been nominated for the Aga Khan Award in 1998. And so without further ado, I would like to ask George to come to the podium. Very much thank him for being here. Uh, this is also very uh, serendipitous in a way because we started off our uh, program of, of uh, related, related events, uh, events related with the exhibition with a, with a conference, uh, Future Architecture, which was hosted in a way or moderated by a Lebanese artist, Mohamed Afda, uh, from London, who came here for that uh, to, to fulfill that role, and we finish uh, the kind of international uh, program of our exhibition with another uh, Lebanese uh, uh, intellectual figure. And so, I would like you to welcome George, Ar George Arpit tonight. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you very much for inviting me here. Thank you, Patricia, Ricardo. Um, uh, I want to tell you that I first came to this institution, it was in the early 90s. I was doing this sort of uh, pilgrimage that uh, many architects do to uh, good architecture. So I'm talking about Siza, Suto de Mura, and so on. So I went to Porto, Evora, Beja, Marco de Canaveses. I still remember the places. It was really very enlightening to me. And of course, I came through Lisbon and I was very happy to discover this uh, great building and institution. I have to say that the building is also fabulous building. Um, I will be speaking uh, about the Arab Center for Architecture, which is an institution that uh, we started in 2008. And it was uh, probably a normal thing to happen after the extensive research I had done for my PhD, my Doctor of Design degree, where I had a lot of trouble finding <coughs> material, original material. So I was uh, basically producing an archive myself with uh, things that were not as important as original drawings. They would be either paper clippings or sketches or remains or photographs and so on. And I had amassed enough material uh, so that my friends told me there should be something done about it. So together we started this institution that is registered as an NGO. So it is a very small institution, but uh, with, with a lot of uh, ambition. And I like to start uh, my presentation with this. I haven't used this image for a while, but I think uh, for this lecture, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, when I was doing my research at the time, I discovered this cover of a magazine uh, from a magazine called Design and Environment. I don't think it uh, comes out anymore. Uh, it's a magazine of 1975. And it was an issue about the Middle East, and uh, it was reduced to a camel. But I was surprised and also happy because I thought I discovered something interesting, which is that th those buildings that are behind the camel are actually the buildings on the shore of Beirut, and therefore this camel is in the Mediterranean Sea, it's not in the Gulf. So this sort of misunderstanding about that part of the world and reducing the Middle East, essentializing it, of course, as a... As a a, a colonial mindset to something that is easily understandable without all its complexities and all the differences that you may find among the Arab countries uh, to start with, uh, was probably triggered uh, an um, even more interest uh, on my part on trying to understand what is it that happened in the, in the meantime. So this is the Beirut, that, uh, uh, the Beirut of the 20th century. And I like also to mention this quote by Tafuri, uh, where he says, those who seem to negate history, in other words, who do not refer to historical reference, produce historically motivated work. It's the work that is of its time because it's not concerned particularly with what happened before. It doesn't mean that it doesn't take the lessons of what happened before or that it does not embed even unconsciously what happened before, but it is not particularly interested in replicating what happened before. On the other hand, those who, who try not to cut their links with history, which is talking about postmodern architecture or any other historical references within architecture, uh, makes us run into the shoals of uh, ambiguity. This is our space. It's a very modest space, as I said, with a lot of uh, ambition. It is in Beirut, in the, in the capital. This is our website. Uh, we do have a Facebook page that uh, 
is very active as well, and I will explain why these are important for us. The Facebook page is, uh, for me, it was a surprise, but the younger generation explained to me that the Facebook, everybody goes on Facebook, very few people now go onto the main pages of institutions, so if you really want people to know exactly what you're doing, forget about the website. Still, I thought it was important. And on the website, what we have that I think is extremely important is a serious database of 500 buildings, 250 architects from the Arab world. And that I really invite you to, to research it. So Beirut is a modern city. And uh, already in 2004, when I had the opportunity to present a poster at the Docomo conference, it was my first encounter with Docomo and the important work that they do. Uh, I had already the impression that uh, Lebanon had been modern, that that idea of progress, progressive architecture and progressive being in art and architecture and so on uh, needed to be uh, explained again because it was being lost with being buildings being demolished, endangered by wrong uh, disfigurement and so on. And lately I discovered these uh, drawings uh, for a competition of 1928, which is our national uh, museum, Museum of Antiquities. And I was very surprised and happy to discover the drawings in the National Library that is not open yet, but I was part of the scientific, what they call the scientific committee for the National Library. And when we visited the place, the lady in charge of the restoration of documents and paper uh, knew that I was an architect. Uh, and she told me, I would like to show you a few drawings. We don't really know what they are. And she opened these rolls of drawings of 1928, and I said, bingo! She said, everybody came to see what happened. I said, these, these are the drawings of the, the finalists of the competition of 1928. 28 was a very important moment because it was a time during the French mandate of the country where the Lebanese had amassed a huge collection of books and magazines and so on. And uh, it was about time to start a library. And at the same time, there was this competition for the... Uh, the National Museum. Competition in which probably more than ever the identity of the country was at stake. What, what building, what style could represent the Lebanon of the 1920s? So here you have three competitors. You can read them by band. So you have the... This is a poster I produced with a little article about it, but I show you a closer image. So this is one of the projects which is a sort of for those who know local architects, sort of palace or Beit din palace transposed into the, into the city, so references to local architecture. And then you have another competitor who proposed some sort of Persian caravanserai. And uh, the project who actually won that everybody looks at as a pharaonic or neo-pharaonic neo project, as if it was a direct reference to Egypt, was actually a building referring to France. Because at the time, France and many cities in Europe were building in the Art Deco style. And the Lebanese were, I mean, at least the Lebanese in charge of the competition, let's say, were looking at France as a reference. So here you have a neo-pharaonic building, I say, by ricochet. You know, like in the billiard game, you have this ricochet. You hit here, but actually the, end, the ball ends up going there. So people were looking at France. France was looking at Egypt. Hence, the Lebanese get a neo-pharaonic building. Uh, and at the same time, we're talking about the late 20s and early 30s, we built in the country a neighborhood that is called the Mara district that some of you may have seen picture of because it was the place where reconstruction uh, after the war of 1990, let's say the war ended in 1990. It is then that this project by Solidaire, it is there that it took place. And therefore, uh, I thought it was important to show uh, these buildings uh, with archives of the time when they were built, because when Solidaire did the reconstruction of the city center, they didn't bother to go and look for the archives of the existing buildings. And this way they had more leeway in deciding what to do with the buildings. So at the same time as some of the architects were designing buildings like these, uh, which are more or less art deco laced with local motifs and so on, uh, they were designing for themselves and for the people around them modern villas, which is like the one you see on the left. This is only two to three years after the building that we saw before, and it's by the same engineer architect. Now, what's interesting about these, uh, this, this sort of uh, house or building that you find in some of the Lebanese mountains is that it is in line with 
uh, what we like to call the archetypical Lebanese house, which is the central whole house. Now, there is a big discussion on how Lebanese it is. Of course, it's a mixture of all sorts of things. Uh, yet, I will not go into that discussion now. But what I want to say is that here we are into a transitional period. It's like a Darwinian evolution of the species, of the type, because it's adapting to uh, to a new situation. You have uh, the, the square that is being uh, dislocated so that you can get more than one orientation and one window for the bedrooms and so on. We're not anymore into... Uh, one-story uh, dwellings, we are into the villa type with two stories uh, going from one floor to the other. There is the use of local crafts with the lower part uh, in uh, uh, dressed stone, and the rest is made of exhibited concrete, uh, whitewashed, and so on. So we're talking about the early 1930s, and this is very early in time for such uh, buildings. In the 1930s and 40s, I will have to go through a quite quick survey, but it's just to give you an idea uh, to explain what happens later. So in the 30s and 40s, you have a lot of these buildings that kept more or less the same uh, type uh, or typology in plan, but uh, things are happening. In other words, you cannot anymore afford to have uh, in front of your living room a view or a garden and so on. You have a building facing you across the street, six, seven meters away. Hence, this model of the triple arched wide hole does not work anymore. So what is happening, again, as a Darwinian evolution, is that this facade is like a nose that becomes longer or something that gets out in order to have a view on the sides. And here you can see that very clearly with these sorts of windows. Huh? So this is extremely important because it is transforming the dwelling from inside at the same time. People do not sit anymore on the sides to appreciate the view. They actually turn their back. So you would have, if you enter these uh, living rooms, you would see that people have their couches or fauteuil or whatever here, and they are looking sideways because there you have the road, the street, and you can see very far. But And you see that gradually the uh, decoration and the sophistication is uh, being lost, of course, because of the advent of a new material that is cement and concrete. Uh, and we have our first cement factory in the country in 1931 uh, already. 50s and 60s uh, are full of these, uh, I call them B-series buildings, like uh, in movies. So they are not star buildings, not designed by star architects. They are not under the spotlight, but the city is full. And I know Lisbon is full of these buildings and other cities around the Mediterranean and on the other side, uh, in the case of uh, Portugal. You have a lot of these buildings that take care of the, let's say, the sun protection in a sound, uh, normal way. They're well built, often by engineer architects, and education has a lot to do with this as well. Uh, many of these buildings were designed by people who were trained as engineers only, but they practiced as architects before there was uh, another generation, let's say, of uh, architects. And here I like to speak about these uh, hollowed out uh, beams that we find on our balconies. Nowadays, people look at them as a decorative motif and so on, but the original reason is extremely technical. It is the best way you can have to protect your facade from the sun, but at the same time ventilate the balcony or the terrace because the hot air pushes, the, the, the cold air pushes the hot air up, and then you have a constant ventilation through these uh, openings. We have lost, unfortunately, that sort of uh, tradition recently. I will quickly show some examples of uh, this modernist architecture of the 40s and so on. So this school by Saeed Hjel, local architects. This is a collaboration between a Lebanese engineer, Beij Maqdisi, and Karol Shire, a Polish architect who arrives in the country in 1946 and stirs things up a little bit. So this is the alumni clubhouse already in 1950. So we are very, very early in time. The Maqasid School by Amin Bizri. And because of my interest in all of this, and as I was teaching, uh, I used to uh, ask students to do models of these buildings and to try to understand their qualities. So this is one of them. And the government was uh, uh, commissioning to architects. A lot, there was a lot of competitions. This had a huge impact because it was an emulation. It was an emulative moment where people were competing. Young architects had a chance to do something progressive, hoping to win the competition. Uh, and this is the case, for example, for Qasim Kanaan uh, with his tobacco factory. He actually designed a few in the country. It's a, it's a public program. And buildings like this one for the Electricité du Liban headquarters, 
uh, was a very smart move on the part of the architects. It was a competition. They were asked to design a building for the electricity company, but mostly to design a huge room where people would go and pay their bills. Uh, all the other competitors put the room on the ground floor, which makes a lot of sense because you want easy access and so on. But this team was quite smart and they actually decided to put it on a lower level with the ramp going down, the offered public space in the piazza, and they elevated the building on piloti, which makes it, and I will show later a drawing, which makes it that from under this piloti, you can see the sea that is not very far. So I argue that this building is extremely contextual without looking into historical reference, which is what I was trying to say when I used the Tafuri uh, example. It, this is one of them. Another one is this mosque by uh, Asim Salam, the Khashoggi Mosque, uh, in which he's not particularly interested in designing the arches on the facade of the building. So the arches are perpendicular to the facade. What the building is offering you is the side of the arches, because he's more interested in the way you circulate around the space that is in front of the actual mosque. Uh, and he's using local stone, local Ramli stone, which is a, a sort of sandstone, and he's actually reinterpreting the, the traditional dome. So here we are in a totally different mindset using the technologies, con contemporary technologies, not in favor of doing a larger normal dome, but experimenting with how we could cover a large space using uh, the new material. And his only reference to Traditional architecture would be, I would say, in this motif that is a sort of arabesque, yet uh, it, is, it is one of the most rigorous uh, architects at the time, yet he would not do it unless it is structural. So he's using the opportunity of these drop beams, I mean like these drop beams that you find here, to create a sort of motif in the, in the ceiling. We have in the archives the, the original drawing of the, of the, of the project. On the other hand, in church design, we also have uh, many, many examples of experimental architecture, like this church by, uh, or chapel by Jacques Ligebeler, who's a Belgian architect who settled in Lebanon very early, married a Lebanese a woman, stayed, he's still there, he's been there 60 years now. Uh, and he designed this uh, chapel, uh, quite extraordinary when you think uh, of the time when uh, you are in a country that is not extremely developed technically, so you have to imagine how difficult it is to design and execute the formwork for this uh, paraboloid, uh, uh, parabol hyperbolique uh, for the for the ceiling. Uh, and you can imagine that he designed, he drew dozens and dozens of sections first for him to understand what he's doing, then to communicate it to the engineer, and last uh, but not least for the for the contractor. And the church is still there. We're talking 1965. And here we get to this theme, and I want to speak about those in particular because uh, they are very symptomatic of uh, local collaborations. So we're not in the model that is most often on encountered today where you have, a, let's say, published and star architects invited either by a private or by a government or by some institution to design. And then they hire around them some local architects to design the permit to uh, put the roles under their, you know, their their arm and start to see how the project can get through, which is unfortunately what's happening uh, more often than not uh, with these collaborations. Here you are in a situation where everybody brought to the table whatever they were good at. So you have a very solid, good local engineer with a very solid local architect and a very solid, talented uh, architect coming from Poland in this case, teaming up to produce in 20 years 140 buildings with extreme consistency. So this is one of their buildings, Dar Sayad, which is a printing press. Uh, I will not dwell too much on explaining it, but I want to say that it is, it will be on the cover of a book that. Uh, I am yet to finish, I'm still working on it. I mean, lately I haven't had a lot of time because uh, I was elected mayor in my village and I have a lot of work. I didn't suspect uh, I it would be a, uh, like a 24 hour uh, emergency job. Uh, so this was delayed a bit, but hopefully uh, it will finish. It will be published by Burkhäuser. And what I try to make visible in this book, beyond the talented, the talent, uh, talented architects and the beautiful designs, is precisely this mechanism. How did this sort of collaboration come to be, and why was it that fruitful? Plus the earlier work of this Polish architect in Poland. He was he, he was brilliant. He did extraordinary work in Katowice in Upper Silesia in the 1930s. 
uh, until he had to flee the, the country because of the war. Uh, in the 70s, uh, we have these, uh, of course, brutalist, brutalism and br brutalist architecture spread uh, all over, and uh, it has its own Lebanese uh, pioneers in a way. This is Khalil al Khouri, very talented architect who designed this sort of spaceship, if you want, uh, which seems to be very blunt and aggressive on the outside. Uh, I think it's very, it sits very well in its site when one knows the neighborhood. Uh, but more importantly, it has this uh, sort of plan, uh, more or less like the Guggenheim, where you have, um, of course here it's not a ramp, it's stairs, but you have these platforms uh, where you can, uh, and it's a furniture showroom, I failed to say it's a furniture showroom. So when you stand at a certain level, uh, you can, across a void, see furniture that is at your eye level. So you don't need to go down to see the legs of a table or a bed or a couch or whatever a desk. You actually see them at the proper level. And uh, of course, you can see the ones that are below and uh, be invited, enticed to go there. You can see a few things from below. So it's a very smart way, of course, also with the way he's bringing light in with indirect light. Uh, this is uh, okay because this is north, so no, no, no extreme light, uh, extreme sun exposure coming from, uh, from this side. Here I placed some uh, photos of the interior showing you the void and how you can uh, appreciate uh, pieces of furniture from a certain level. Unfortunately, this sort of building may not survive because the, the enter design uh, went more or less bankrupt and the uh, bank took the building and now they are dividing all these spaces uh, into cubicles and they're putting aluminum uh, frames and glass and so on. So this idea of a open space, of a free flowing uh, space and circulation is being lost and we have serious uh, uh, worries about, about it. Then uh, came the war in 1975 until 1990 and after the war the reconstruction project. I like always to show these images coming from the report of the private company uh, that uh, was in charge of rebuilding the city center. I don't know how the audience, uh, how familiar is the audience with it, but you need to know that after 1990, a private company was created that, was, that gave itself actually the task of rebuilding uh, the, the center. Uh, and along with this, of course, a lot of propaganda was uh, ready. Uh, namely, uh, photos like this where you have people discussing participation, but it's actually the board talking to each other. They're not talking to, to everybody. They're talking to each other. And they are playing with the city like uh, good boys, you know, you have the models, they are playing around. Everybody's happy, everybody's uh, wealthy, rich, so there's a promise that we will all be wealthy because they know how to do it. Uh, but uh, this, these things, of course, did not happen as, uh, as planned or as promised, at least. So this is the part that is uh, handled by uh, Solidaire during reconstruction. And uh, this is a very interesting document by a German researcher who went and monitored every demolition. Uh, everything that is in blue in this uh, map is demolished after the war, not because of the war. Uh, what is black is what remained in that city center. Uh, what is yellow was demolished until 1991, which is more or less, I mean, the war ended in 1990. So we can see that this uh, reconstruction project was mostly a demolition project, more than a reconstruction. Uh, of course, it's too easy to say like that, and one has to maybe decide uh, uh, on a piecemeal thing, because some buildings were seriously dangerous, but many were not at all. So one has to investigate even more, but maybe it's too late now to complain about that. That's a fact. Uh, we ended up having a huge tabula rasa. And what was interesting is that after uh, 2005, uh, when the prime minister at the time, Rafi Hariri, was killed, and uh, you had all these demonstrations, one million people in the square or around, which is the, almost the fourth of the population of the country huh, coming for this, uh, right after it, a few months after it, uh, the Solidaire uh, gave a lecture in our university again to speak about the project. And interestingly enough, they added this in the bullet points uh, of what they offer. So, Martin Square, arena for political change. Before that moment, we were told that we should forget about 
uh, our fights as Lebanese, you know, confessional fights and sectarian and so on. We have to get together in the center, forget about politics, come and buy and sell and uh, appreciate, you know, Lebanese culture and what have you. And suddenly, because there was this manifestation and a million people in the square, ah, oh, it's a good idea. We have, a, we have made a big tabula rasa. Okay, let's say that it's good for demonstrations. You want to demonstrate? Please come. We, we have the space for you. One million people, no problem. We can house them in here. So there was this, so cynical actually, I, f I found that extremely disturbing, but now I find it funny because you have finally to laugh about certain things. And many buildings outside of the city center were also victims of that, uh, namely this hotel that was important when it was built and for many years, uh, not because it was a masterpiece of architecture, I have to say it's very elegant and so on, but not only for that, because it's a place where hundreds of art exhibitions happened, um, thousands of weddings happened, a lot of other events that made sense to, to, to the city dwellers happened. Uh, and unfortunately, it was, uh, it was demolished. So it is then that I started coining this as the, 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 the amnesic phoenix. So we have this myth of the phoenix rising from the ashes. And of course, it's good for our morale to say that the, no matter what happens, the Lebanese are resourceful. They will like the phoenix because we think we are Phoenicians. So like the phoenix, we will survive again no matter what and so on. But we survive with amnesia. We forget everything that came before. We demolish and we start again. And this is very unfortunate. And in another place, I wrote about it also here, where I say that... Uh, Okay, the phoenix rises, but uh, for whom? Who's benefiting of this idea of uh, demolish and start over again and start over again? And I started looking also at uh, how architecture was uh, used as propaganda. For example, for this uh, hotel, I was surprised. I said, okay, I usually see this hotel from the city, not from the sea, but I, I have a strange feeling about it, where's the city? So I had a student who used to do some diving, so I asked him to, when he was going to dive with his uh, you know, uh, boat, to take a photo from the sea, and actually he took this photo. So the, the actual uh, city was photoshopped from the propaganda. So you have this beautiful hotel by the water, uh, you're not on an island, there is a city behind, but you can, you can forget about the city, it doesn't matter anymore. So this idea of the neighborhood, the city, the context, and so on, uh, I was interested in how it could be that easily erased uh, in the propaganda. And uh, this idea that, of, after all, we don't need to demolish everything. All, let's keep a few buildings, but uh, that's fine. I mean, I'm all for the preservation of fine quality buildings, but we can also invent fake old architecture, which is the case with uh, such buildings, the Saifi village. So it takes these arches and spreads them on the facade and so on, but then when you study uh, the project, of course, th there is nothing as telling as a construction. Uh, it is there that you, things are revealed even before the project finishes. But uh, more importantly, when you look at that and then you look at the plans, you see that, for example, the triple arches that were in the typical central hall plan in the middle of the facade, bringing a lot of light in the public space of the, of the dwelling and of the house, becomes here one window of one of the bedrooms. And the major living space ends up having two windows because the idea they're having of what the building should look like and what the building actually is, is not the same. So they don't match, but it doesn't matter. So we're in a totally different era, if you want, in terms of the connection between inside and outside and so on. And what is offered to us as public space is a place where if you go at the moment uh, during the day, you have two policemen, uh, 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 a boy or a girl playing, and then maybe somebody who's in charge of that, a maid or somebody who's uh, helping out, and this is it. So great surveillance uh, and uh, not that welcoming. And what happened also to many of the major buildings like this one, which is the uh, Presidential Palace, so it's a building that was supposed when it was built to represent this openness of the country and so on, it sits as at the crest of a, of a hill, uh, open on all the sides and so on. It was, uh, I say, Lebanonized during uh, renovation. So it's as if you cannot get there without knowing where you are. So you arrive suddenly in front of the presidential palace and you say, ah, they need the archers to tell me that I'm in front of the presidential palace. It's ridiculous. I mean, you know where you are. You don't need the arches. You're already, <laughs> you already know where you are. So, so this idea of uh, easy representation, easy historical reference, started to be spread from normal buildings to major buildings after a period where 
as I mentioned before, you had this emulation and uh, this sort of competition uh, to build an architecture of its time. And we started seeing buildings like this. For example, this is the residence of the Speaker of the House of Parliament. It's not an addition to anything. Uh, so it, is, it, it was built in 1996 from scratch. So it's pretending a historical presence. And here, the, the residence of the late Prime Minister, which is a combination of neoclassical versus uh, some local tiles and so on, uh, is also, so across the board you had this sort of uh, attitude, and public buildings of this sort, uh, postmodern buildings, 30 years after the trend, started to appear again and again, uh, and the city uh, was completely transformed. Whereas in the meantime, because of reconstruction and speculation, we lost dozens and hundreds of very fine buildings of the late 19th century, like this one, or this one, or this hotel in the city center. This is not demolished, but it's endangered, seriously endangered, the St. George Hotel, one of the first buildings with exposed concrete of the 1930s, of course influenced by Perret. I was very happy to, uh, I mean, happy and unhappy, but uh, to see that the, the, the whole neighborhood was done as a model because uh, Rafi Hariri, our late prime minister, was killed there at the door of the hotel with a huge uh, uh, bomb, uh, and uh, the, in La Hague, in the tribunal, they, they reconstituted the, the best model I ever saw of a neighborhood for uh, forensic reasons, not for uh, design reasons. So I thought we have competitors, so if you need, uh, if there are architects in the room who need model makers, go to the <laughs> forensic guys, they will give you the most precise, uh, precise models. We lost buildings like these, 1933, the Jacques Tabet building in the city square, this one was the first building to have long spans, 10 meter spans. We are in 1935, 10 meter spans in concrete for a, a car garage underground. We lost these hotels in the center. Villas like this one that were also extremely interesting in their layout because here you have a reminiscence of the central hall, but it is a split level now because the owner has a clinic, so I have a split level to go down to the clinic, to go up to the bedrooms and so on. But the model is somehow still there. There is like a palimpsest. It's being written, the history is being written in the minds of the designers with some remains of what they had before. This was demolished. Cinema Rivoli demolished as well. The residence of the uh, former president, Camille Chamon of the 50s was demolished. Gondol building. So I'm, I'm showing the demolished buildings to get to the point where I will explain that it was extremely important to actually start to try to do something and make a difference. This is by Michel Ecochard. The, the condition you can see in the lower part. The Ministry of Defense is constantly threatened. There were some additions to it. This is a masterpiece by Wojensky and Hendie. Maurice Hendie, a very good local architect with a French Wojensky. Wojensky was a chef d'atelier at Le Corbusier's office for 20 years, and then he partnered with Hindi for many years, and then uh, each of them went uh, on his own. And uh, interestingly, to speak about identity, uh, they were asked by the generals to design something that was Lebanese, and they wanted actually to do a, a good building that functions properly. Uh, and of course, their idea of the galleries, for example, was interpreted uh, with these uh, sort of uh, mushroom columns and slabs, so you can go under the buildings without being harmed by the rain and the sun and so on. And they also did these elements to protect the windows from the harsh sun. But the, the windows are not arched, actually. They are T-shaped. And uh, interestingly enough, I interviewed uh, Wojanski at the time, before he died, and he told me, well, uh, we designed it so that we could uh, be satisfied with our design, but if they want to see arches in it, they are free to do so. So I think it's a very sm smart move on the part of the architect, our architect, where uh, he or she can design something they are convinced of, and if you want to interpret something figurative in it, it's your job, your business. Hence this idea of the rhythm from afar, but actually they are T-shaped. They did not do the concession of drawing them as arches. And Hindi uh, goes on, the, the partner of Wojanski goes on to design this chalet for himself, which was uh, something for the time. His idea was to have six like that, like a Lego piece uh, going down the, the hill. Uh, very smart on the, on the inside, but he actually ended up building only one because it turned out to be expensive, and then the war would erupt three years later. 
very smart uh, piece of architecture. This one is partly uh, disfigured on the, on the seashore. The City Palace Cinema is also, this building was demolished. Uh, the part of the cinema was cut. There's a very interesting story about this because at the time, you were not allowed to build on top of movie theaters. They were afraid that the building would collapse on uh, an audience that would be in the, in the cinema. Uh, so the architect that was very, uh, who was very smart, José Philippe Karam, um, managed to convince uh, the authorities that, well, after all, you forbid me to build on top of the cinema, but you cannot forbid me to build under it. So he raised uh, the cinema itself and gained all the ground floor as uh, shops and uh, patisserie for uh, the famous uh, sweet shop in the, in the country. So this remained as an example. It's still there in uh, quite a bad condition now. This we, we have in the archives uh, this section. And this is its condition now. So we're not even sure that it will survive. It's in the Solidaire uh, area. This was demolished. This magnificent villa was demolished. It sits on several levels and on split levels. So here you have part of the house that extends to outside, a split level for the dining room that extends to outside, and so on. This villa was transformed on the inside. You can see here how uh, the fireplace was supposed to be a stone wall taking you from outside to inside and then uh, exposed stone and now it is dressed like this in neoclassical uh, motifs which is quite unfortunate. The Jaita Grotto, uh, known site in Lebanon, it's one of the beautiful natural sites with these stalactites and uh, water inside. Uh, Hassan Klink was invited to do the pathway, so he did this sort of ribbon in concrete, and he, the story goes that he slept there for two months and was with the workers to make sure that they break the minimum amount of, of stalactites and so on. So you see that this is sort of floating inside the space. Uh, but the wrongdoing was done outside for the cabin station designed by Maurice Hindiye, and later it was dressed, and you have these ingredients, a checklist of things to make it Lebanese. You put the red tiles, you put the uh, arches, you use the stone, uh, dress stone, and so on, uh, and you disfigure, actually, the buildings. And I went once to look for this building. I knew where it was, but I was looking for it. I could not find it. Uh, went back and I was told, no, no, it is there, but it was transformed. They said slightly transformed, actually. I will show you how much it was transformed. So it was dressed also in a Lebanese uh, garb, okay? And, and so again, this issue of identity. I mean, this is a whole for weddings and events and so on. It doesn't need any of this. So this is how it is from the inside, and this is how it became now. So we're talking about the same building, huh? dressed. And again, this issue of identity is a problem. Same for this crafts showroom. Uh, for the Lebanese crafts, the architects uh, decided to design a glass box suggesting the arches and the vaults, but uh, the structure is a feat for the time. It's all in steel and so on. And uh, lately, it was transformed into a restaurant and became this. Huh? So this is on the inside. You see there's wire mesh and plaster and so on. So we, the architect had suggested the vault and maybe it was a mistake on his part because it ended up becoming a fake one uh, later. But I don't think he was wrong. I think the project was one of the best at the time. And Hotel Fenicia, which is an icon uh, in the city, had these very slender columns. And now they are dressed with uh, you know, Roman capitals, arches, stones, and so on. And it's disfigured from the inside as well. And some fake connection between old and new was created. So when you look at this building, you may think that this building existed, and then you have a new contemporary glass. Well, no, no wrong. <laughs> you are wrong if this is what you think, because this building was actually this one. So it is a different building. So it was demolished, and they created a fake 1920s building, added next to it a glass box to make the joke of the old and the new, and so on. This one was like that, okay? It was built in different periods. In the 50s, it was like this. Later, it was dressed to look more in the vein of what was uh, under it. The airport was demolished and a new one was built. The Cité Sportive that was maybe, again, not a masterpiece, but a good rational building was, uh, demoli I mean, it was demolished by the Israelis, I have to say. Uh, not by the people who, who rebuilt it, so it was because of the war. However, uh, it was a missed opportunity to actually design a beautiful 
contemporary modern piece of architecture that usually stadiums give you as opportunity. I mean, you have a great example here with a, with a, a Shab uh, 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 sports place. So here you have, a, again, a, a Pomo building quite late in time. With a mix, I cannot say if it's Roman, if it's Arab. If I, I, I'm, I'm not really sure, but I know that it's a steel structure on the top with aluminum alucobond panels. So we are very far from the rational architecture of the earlier times, and you start seeing buildings that either refer to historical traditional buildings, and this is uh, built in the 90s, or buildings that fake modernism, which ends up being uh, just a, a play on forms and so on. Uh, so there is a big misunderstanding and a big mess. This is a building of 1950s. This is a building of 2000 in a neighborhood that never had these mansards. So we're talking about Hamra, which is a very busy district in, in Beirut, built mostly in the 50s. So it gets me quickly to my point. Here you have the uh, Oscar Niemeyer Fair, in the International Fair, Rashid Karami Fair in Tripoli, uh, built in 19, between 1962 and 19. Uh, 75 and then stopped uh, because of the war and this is uh, a model this is the site in construction at the at our archives we have a lot of photographs during construction and some interesting documents uh, but what i want to show is what happened to uh, this building which is the experimental housing uh, designed by Niemeyer. this these are the sketches it's like a immeuble villa you know the double height uh, duplexes and this it was transformed into into this, which is the most banal hotel you can you can imagine. It's called Quality Inn. I always do the same joke, like an old professor. I say it's Quality Out. I even ask a student to Photoshop the the sign. So instead of Quality Inn, it's Quality Out. And in that uh, huge compound, which is one million square meters, uh, every few years we have to do an alert and run and say, please, please stop, don't do it. We start praying so that they don't get the money to do it. So here they wanted to design or build a fake village within the Tripoli Fair. So you demolish villages and then you create fake villages in a Oscar Niemeyer masterpiece. I will uh, spare you. So we get to the second part of the lecture, which is the Arab Center. So now I think that by now you understand the need for a place where we can, you know, calm down of all what we've been doing, discuss things, try to make sense of history, collect archives, understand uh, those buildings, uh, put them at the service of students, researchers, publish. You can imagine all that comes uh, after this. So these are, for example, uh, archives that uh, of the Polish architect and his partners, uh, Maqdisi and Adib. This, this was the condition before I spent a few months there and uh, cleaned the the, the drawings, and, uh, and fortunately, they decided uh, finally to give us the drawings, so we have all the collection, and this is why I have this huge monograph and whole beautiful exhibition that will come out of that uh, that work. And here you have the final project of uh, the first Lebanese architect who graduated from MIT, 1915. Was very happy to find in the drawers of the of the MIT. It's not a museum, but it's like an MIT archive his final project. So you find all the student project from the time MIT started. And I was also, for me, this is a revealing moment when uh, I went on a Saturday to look at the drawings closer and uh, the lady says, well, you can uh, you can take them from that drawer. I went, took the drawings. I, they are uh, canson with the watercolor on them. So I took the drawings and I had my fingertips really, really on the side. I was aware that I shouldn't be putting them in the middle. And then she shouts at me, say, what are you doing? Put your fingers off and so on. So I said, okay, this is serious. So I compared that moment of, you know, the, the, this employee of an archive who was keen on not letting anybody put any fingerprint on it. And in our part of the world, we were, you know, burning archives, throwing archives, uh, tearing, tearing archives, not caring about the importance of things. So for me, that was uh, uh, like a re revelation, like a revealing moment where I thought, no, something should be done. We are doing it the wrong way. So we started this institution, the Arab Center for Architecture, this is our logo, uh, just uh, basically for you to understand uh, what is it that we want to say with the logo. This is letter A for Arab and architecture, and it is Ain for Arabi, because we, of course, 
communicate also in our mother tongue, which is Arabic. So Arabi and Amara, and this is a shelter for the for the. So we're we're sheltering architecture. We're trying to preserve architecture. The website and the the email. You can see that later. So what we want to do is to raise awareness about architecture for the large public, uh, not only in universities and among architects. It's useless to only talk among architects. We want to develop the cultural value of architecture and recognize its importance, especially in our part of the world where we are now in a big mess, political mess, identity mess, and so on. Uh, we want it to be a platform to, for discussion. We, we build an archive, we initiate research, we promote knowledge, and we participate we try to at least participate in the protection. I will go faster because I think I've said many of these ideas as I was uh, talking. So uh, we want to engage with the large public, with schools, with kids. I will show you what we're doing also with kids. We help young associations. They go on TV and insult a minister who decided to demolish a building. We give them the information so that they know why they are insulting. I mean, it's okay to do it, but more importantly, you need to know what is important about what you're doing. And it doesn't make sense to constantly lament. I mean, you have to make some sort of rational and sense. And we help a lot in that, in that regard. Uh, when I say we, of course, I'm not alone. I have a lot of colleagues, former students, uh, a lot of volunteers. We cannot afford to pay anybody. We all work freely. Uh, we do communication. We uh, produce exhibitions. We curate exhibitions. We were able to publish a few things that I will show. Uh, even before the center was uh, actually there because I had amassed some material, we did an exhibition. We invited Dokomomo to come to Beirut in 2006. That was before, two years before. Uh, we did uh, an event. Uh, about the Tripoli Fair to call for its preservation already in 2005. These are posters of the first exhibition that uh, I did myself before the center was created. Uh, these, for example, are final projects. This is the f one of the final projects, the one in, at MIT, and this is another one. Uh, this one uh, was in charge of a school and for education at the American University, so it's very important to understand what's his background uh, and that was just the first time we spoke about him. I will go quicker. These are the sorts of buildings that we use in the exhibition. Furniture, we do have a collection of uh, drawings of furniture of the 50s, original drawings. Uh, in teaching, I enforce as much as possible the idea of the adaptive reuse of buildings uh, because I think it's a very sustainable uh, idea and attitude. Uh, we started the Dokomomo, as uh, Ricardo mentioned, uh, at the Finland uh, conference in 2012. I have to say we haven't been very active with Dokomomo because we're, we're taken by a lot of things and there is sort of duality between the Arab Center and the Dokomomo, but the objectives are the same. Uh, but we do have uh, something to start with. Uh, we created uh, this sort of association with uh, four institutions. One of them is uh, the Arab Image Foundation that I mentioned to you earlier, uh, and I guess uh, you would be interested to talk to them because they have the visual collection of Rafat Jadirji, the photographs of his projects, and a lot of photos of uh, Iraq and Baghdad at the time. Uh, so that's if you want to push this, and I think this work can and have to, has to be pushed in some way. So that's one of the sources that you can look at. Uh, so we have these associations that all deal with modern heritage, whether film, uh, recordings, cinema, architecture, uh, we organize together workshops to learn from each other. Uh, we produce this publication. You can find it. It's the Modern Heritage Observer. You can find the PDF in English and Arabic on the web. These are the workshops, international conferences. And we had that possibility through money from the European Union. Uh, we applied for a grant, a cultural grant. Uh, this is the website of the Modern Heritage Observatory. We help the young associations like Save Beirut Heritage with the information that I mentioned before to save neighborhoods and buildings. We document, we have a collection of books and magazines and so on. Uh, we collect physical archives. We don't have uh, means to buy anything. Uh, all that we can do is uh, clean the drawings, put them in boxes, in acid-free paper, inside non-acid-free boxes, but we cannot afford to buy acid-free boxes, uh, and draw a list until uh, we can do something better with that. So these are, this is the way the drawings are kept. Uh, we've learned a little bit on the task. We sent Claudine, who's uh, now the vice president of the association. She went to the IFA in Paris to learn about these things. 
So we put the drawings in acid-free paper with a content thread, we write in lead, so it's the minimum. Uh, of course, we don't have important fire extinguishers, so I don't sleep at night. I always have these nightmares where I think, oh, okay, I've collected all these things for them to burn at once. And maybe keeping them where they are is less uh, dangerous, but you never know. So for now, we've escaped this. Uh, I have a series of recordings. When I was doing my uh, dissertation, I interviewed people. Uh, and uh, my friends say that I killed them all because they were all above 80. And uh, of course the wife would tell me, it's, it's enough, enough for two days. So I would pump them three hours, four hours of interviews until I fill two, three cassettes and write everything. And my friends tell me, don't go and see anybody else. You will kill them all. But I, I was very happy to talk to them because this is a generation that, uh, first of all, is extremely modest. They did extraordinary work. They, they, they don't have a blog, they don't have a Facebook page. They don't have an agent or a manager or a special photographer. Uh, they think that their work is okay. And do you think their work is fabulous? They tell you, well, we've tried to do something simple and good and so on. So no rubbish, no, no talk, 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 talk. Uh, very well, uh, I mean, um, often they can tell you a lot of interesting stories about the profession and how things happen. Rarely talk about themselves, uh, so these interviews for me are, are very important. We transform them into MP3, so it's okay. They're not only on uh, magnetic cassettes. We have uh, beautiful original drawings, as I said, in our collection. This is, for example, the competition drawing of the Electricité du Liban that we saw before. This is the line uh, of the, the horizon line, and this is what made them win. So it's important to know that. Uh, we have drawings like these, detailed drawings by Anthony Irving, a British architect who worked in Lebanon, Kuwait, and the, the Emirates. Variations on a house by Farid Trad. Uh, this is a success story. We have very few success stories, but in this case, uh, we were contacted by uh, an association in Shariqa, in Sharjah, in the Emirates, and uh, th those schools were being demolished. They're, these are designed by Reyes and Tukhan. They designed seven of them as prototypes with little variations, and they were being demolished one after the other. But in Sharqa, they decided for a reason to keep one of them. Uh, so they knew that we had the archives, so we were extremely happy to send them 110, of course, scans of the drawings. So now they are renovating, I don't know how far they went, but they are renovating based on the original drawings, which seldom happens. I gave you the example of the city center reconstruction in Lebanon. So for us, this uh, made sense, and we do exist for a reason. We're not just uh, piling dust and, and so on. So these are some of the drawings. It's a very interesting uh, project because it's like a big mat with punched holes, and it has the Malqaf, which is a ventilation device, extremely interesting. Before we started to talk all the time about uh, sustainability and so on, uh, we invite students and their professors to our center to uh, uh, do exhibitions and so on. This is a jury. We organize an exhibition in Beirut about our archives, and uh, we called it the beginnings of a project, which what, what we meant by that is our project. We call for the preservation. This is a document, for example, that for me makes a lot of sense. Uh, it is uh, the notebook of a student in uh, engineering, engin as engineer architect in the 40s, in 1942. So he was simply a diligent student doing his summer work. Uh, and this is uh, probably the only full-fledged document about the ways of construction of the 1940s in Lebanon. No design magazines, no architecture magazines, very few engineering magazines. They wouldn't go as far as documenting everything that is being built. So we can find archives in unsuspected places. And a document that is not supposed to be a major document can become the document in an exhibition or in a place. For me, this was the masterpiece of that exhibition. Because the rest is more or less easy, a photo or whatever. But the notebook of a student documenting everything uh, from the cost of uh, uh, every material to what happens when somebody is uh, hurt on a site to anything. So it's very interesting. So this is it. I think he had a good grade, yes. 18.5, not bad. And it documents things like uh, how do you build an arch with a formwork? How do you make sure that the radius is right? So, so there is a nail here with this piece of wood. So it's a radius they practically built as we think. Uh, this is the building where we did the exhibition, so we were very happy to have two of the drawings and exhibited them, a building of 1936. We produced a set of postcards for the occasion, uh, 16 postcards uh, showing a variety of uh, things, from drawings to old photos and 
sketches and furniture. We uh, are part of a larger uh, world institution, which is the, the archives, uh, ECAM, I think it's called, I can't remember, Claudine takes care of that. But we are part of that and we organize uh, the International Archives Day every year. We invite people to our place, namely kids and others, to speak about the importance of documents. These are some of the modest exhibitions that we do. Here I would like to show this uh, couch. With the, we have the original drawing of it, which is scale one to one, without any dimension because it is to scale. And we have like 40 of these, part of the exhibition we will do about the Polish architect and his first partner who's a German uh, designer. So these are part of the scans that we have. It's extraordinary collection on butter paper with color. Here we exhibited them. An exhibition on interiors of buildings, the crafts of art within architecture. Uh, another exhibition on the skins of buildings using our, our own archives. A program for a year uh, from a grant from the European Union as well. We called it Revealing Architecture. I will go quickly. Kids doing models. Guided tours, we organize guided tours. We produce these leaflets explaining the importance of the neighborhoods and uh, historical. On the back of this, I didn't put any, uh, any one of the ver verso sides, but uh, there is a text about the neighborhood explaining its importance and its history. So these are the guided tours. There are 12 of them. Maybe now we have more. Let me go quickly. We introduced modern architecture within the program of the Ministry of Culture. There is a National Heritage Day, and you can imagine that they invite people to go and visit ancient places and museums and so on. And we actually were able to introduce at least one visit to a modern uh, site within the National Heritage Day. And we're interested in the history of technology as well. So this is a visit to a train station. Let me go quickly. We organized lectures as conversations between an old architect and a young architect. And these were very successful. Uh, you see on the posters that we put a drawing, not a photograph, because it's to uh, emphasize the importance of the hand, first of all, of the creator of the building, but also the idea of the archive. Uh, one, one is, uh, this is Maaz Alusi, an Iraqi, I don't know if, uh, his name uh, was mentioned to you during your work or research. Very good architect. He was a collaborator of Shadirji at first, then opened this thing. Now he's uh, retired in Cyprus. Uh, he's a very, very talented architect and, and artist. And we put him with a Syrian uh, professor uh, who came from Damascus for the occasion, Wael Samhuri. We also organized a series of lectures between a writer and an architect. And it goes along this idea that we want to uh, stop talking to each other as architects. So we took uh, cities and we invited a writer about a city to talk in front of us uh, to an architect or planner uh, who works in that city. So we had three of them. Uh, we did it with a, a writer's association. Uh, and for us, it was also a, a mind, uh, um, an important thing to think about. We also do these visits with architects, contemporary architects, where students can visit with the architect their, their work. And uh, it brings me to uh, something that was for us a milestone, which is uh, that Bernard Khoury, who's a friend architect who's part of our board, uh, was invited to curate the Bahrain Pavilion in the Venice Biennale 2014. Maybe some of you visited it. Uh, and he uh, asked me to co-curate it with him because it was a hundred years of architecture in the in the Arab world, uh, at least for what we decided to do. Uh, and Bahrain agreed to actually offer its pavilion to the rest of the Arab world. So what we did uh, with Bernard, he designed it, uh, is a ceiling in the pavilion where you have 22 uh, times the same person uh, repeating what you will uh, what you will hear now. موطني بحرينيا مديني وعاش المديني رمز الوئع الجلال ساميه يستولها على المخافقات في المعارف نحن أحرجنا المدلات والأجهزة 
So you get the picture. You don't understand anything, but even if you spoke Arabic, you wouldn't. Because it is 22 national anthems of the Arab world that he is repeating, and they are all at the same time. And we wanted to speak of the chaos. It was already the wars between the Arab countries, Syria on one side and its allies, uh, Saudi Arabia and its allies, and Lebanon you know, stretched in between and so on. So the idea was to represent the table of the Arab League, uh, with 22 chairs, 22 uh, uh, headphones, and 22 national anthems repeated at the same time. And there is a map of the Arab world that is on the table here, we will see it, uh, where you have these uh, uh, sort of uh, representations of the buildings uh, that we, that I, actually I decided to put in the book, 100 buildings for 100 years. Uh, so Bahrain uh, accepted the idea and Finally, you had 40,000 copies of the book uh, on the shelves, and people could simply come and uh, take their copy of the book. Funny thing is that students uh, thought that they were stealing them. So they would come with their backpack and you know, take one from the back. So I was there for a few days. I went to one student and I said, uh, you took a book, didn't you? He said, yes, sorry, but I don't know if I should buy it. Where can I? I said, no, no, please take two. He thought I was joking. You know, sometimes you can be cynical with somebody. You know, take two, take three. What are you doing? You're stealing. It. I said, no, no, really take two, but make sure you give it to somebody who will read it because people don't read anymore. And they were so happy because in big exhibitions like this, of course, you have these huge digital exhibitions and so on, and you end up having a little leaflet. And of course, they tell you, you can find everything on the web. Uh, but there is a pleasure. I'm sure many of you are architects. This pleasure of the paper. And the book was so well done by a, a Swiss uh, by a British graphic designer who worked with us on it. Uh, he lived in Switzerland, so he, we, we, with him, we won the award of the most beautiful Swiss book and the most beautiful design book of the world. I didn't even know such a thing existed. <laughs> so I started calling the book the Georgina Reze of books because Georgina Reze was the Miss Universe. She was Lebanese in the 1970s, so we were still waiting. Now every year when there is Miss Universe, we are all on TV hoping that uh, the Miss Lebanon will win anyway, it's a funny thing. But so this is the Georgina Reze of books, one minute. So to finish the story, this is the Arab world engraved in, on the table. You have a timeline, the most interesting piece for me is the timeline that we did around the table. So year by year from 1914 to 2014, you have little events written here. And we flattened history. The event could be, for example, the election of Georgina Reza as Miss Universe. And next to it, you have a coup d'etat in Iraq. Or next to it, you have the uh, publication of a book by Hassan Fathi or whatever. So we want, what we are trying to say is that architecture is produced by historical events. And in, in return, it produces historical events. So we would not want to be elitist in saying, you know, these are the important dates in the history of the Arab world. Finally, everything was important. And there was another interesting trick in the timeline, which is that if you stand, let's say here in front of the 1920s, if you see this number, it means that it was built more or less in the same period. If this one is turned a bit to the right, it was built a, f a few years later. So it's a timeline. It's a phenomenological timeline. It's, it works as you, with your senses. You turn around in time and you see the thing. And people didn't like that we didn't put a poster explaining it. We said, if you guess it, fine. You don't guess it, you, you're still uh, OK. Anyway, and it had the flags also. The flags, people would notice that in the years between 1914 and the 40s, you had uh, uh, foreign flags non-Arab flags, because it was the time of colonies, mandates, and so on, and very few schools of architecture. Between the late 40s and the 80s, you have a lot of Arab flags as, as uh, designers, architects. And after that, because of the, the money went to the Gulf, and you have all these you know, technological buildings, uh, towers, and so on, that require some sort of expertise, then you have, uh, again, the foreign flags. And this is the space. I will quickly move. I'm sorry, maybe I took too much time but I want to get to the end of the lecture safely. So the book that was produced uh, then, just to show you a few pages. Interestingly, because it's chronological, you would discover that uh, history is not uh, uh, synchronic. So you have, when we speak of, let's say, the 50s, 50s doesn't mean the same thing here and there and there. So you have Hassan Fathi doing this, and you have this building in Beirut at the same time. Of course, they're not the same program, but uh, we, we discovered uh, many surprises when you oppose these pages one after the other. Here you have, for example, a German uh, architect uh, designing uh, for Abdel Nasser the stadium in Cairo. And it turned out that it was the same designer who designed the Berlin stadium in the 30s 
for the Nazis. It's funny because you have the same architect designing for the extreme right and also left, clearly left Abdel, uh, for Abdel Nasser. And Abdel Nasser is the only person we see in the whole book. You know, this is the, the, the image of a possible unity, or at least it was thought at the time, unity of the Arab world. I will make it uh, quicker, the awards. I spoke about that. Then we were invited by UNESCO to curate an exhibition about architecture in the Arab world. It was very tough to decide on one building per country. Really very tough, but uh, I did it, so. Uh, this is, for example, one of the pages. We have it in English, uh, French, and Arabic, the location of the buildings on the map. Here I show the Mustansiriya. I was glad to see that you have in your exhibition the, the auditorium. Now, I'm not sure, uh, I'm, I'm almost sure that it's not uh, Qahtan Auni who designed the, the auditorium. Uh, but this is, for me, is one of the best pieces uh, in university design. It has these courtyards. And uh, this is two meters away from the facade that is behind. It uses local crafts. It is a climate responsive building. It uses the possibility of technology. Don't need to have the columns for the arches. So this is a cantilever. It's very, very, very refined. Unfortunately, this architect died rather young. Here you have two examples. This is in Egypt. This is in uh, Kuwait. This is in Syria National Library in uh, Jordan. Uh, this is the matrix, just to show that uh, I, I'm sure every curator in the room knows how difficult it is to decide what to keep out of an exhibition. or uh, It's more difficult than uh, to choose what to keep in. But anyway, so this is just for the sake of the exercise, first choice, second choice, you don't sleep at night, and so on. And you end up having the exhibition. And when you go, when you go to the exhibition, uh, you are happy or unhappy to see that uh, nobody thinks that the choices you made are good. But then you start asking them, okay, if you come from Egypt, please tell me which is your, the building that would represent Egypt. So you give me a building. And then I ask him, and it's another building. And I ask him, it's another building. So then you say, I'm safe. I'm as wrong as all of you, so it's fine. But at least I wrote a text to explain why it is. It didn't say I like it or whatever. So you're, you're safe. Uh, then we work also, we worked here with uh, Hala Yunis, uh, who curated this uh, exhibition, uh, which is the first Lebanese pavilion uh, at the Venice Biennale of 2018. She did a great job, uh, I have to say. The topic was uh, the place that remains, or what is left, working with what is left. And here it was mostly about the Lebanese landscape and what are the opportunities and challenges in uh, keeping what should be kept and then using the unused land for something that makes sense. It was really a brilliant exhibition. It is a model in wood. Uh, seven or eight meters long with all the relief. It was The idea was to show the relief and projections of maps uh, on top of it. And she produced uh, that beautiful book, The Place That Remains, Matabaka. Uh, and I was also uh, very happy to see uh, what happened when uh, this bank asked us to write uh, about architecture because it's designing its, hand its headquarters and so on. And I was skeptical at first. I said, why do we need to do something for a bank? I'm not sure and so on. Uh, and then I discovered that uh, with a few lines written and some of our archives, we have 30,000 likes. Uh, I don't look like a Facebook generation person, but uh, I was so happy to see that sometimes uh, there are people who can vehiculate your ideas much faster than you do when you can imagine. And if architecture can become a topic that people will talk about and think about and reflect about, uh, any, for me, at this point, everything is fine. Anything, and they're doing a great job in that regard. Uh, the a factory that I, somebody came once to our offices ran, and knocked on the door and said, uh, we know you're interested in archives and so on. There is a building that is abandoned and there are a lot of drawings on the floor and the drawers are open. I said, where is it? They said in Adonis, it's an area uh, north of Beirut. And I said, uh, what type of building it is? They said, we think it's a factory. I said, it must be the aluminum factory, the Ajax, because I knew it was there. So we went there. And uh, this is what we discovered. So this is a factory that started in 1957 or 58, stopped in 2005, and actually did 80% of the aluminum in the Arab world, for major buildings, I say. Hundreds and hundreds and thousands of major buildings. So all the drawings were on the floor. Not the drawings of the buildings, but the drawings of the profile. So if one wants to do a great PhD on the history of profiling, we have it. We have the material. So this is the condition in which the building was. We were so afraid that uh, everything would be gone that we stole the drawings. 
So Claudine, our vice president said, but you're crazy. How can we take this? These are not ours. What if the police came? And so I said, I wish the police comes. It would be the best propaganda for us. Imagine me like an absent-minded professor, you know, <laughs> taken to jail because he's saving the memory of it. It's the best. But nobody came on Sunday. They don't work. The policemen don't work. <laughs> so we went on Sunday. And uh, this is a photo I found on the ground of the lobby of the, uh, the firm. But this is the condition. This is how it was. We found photos of it during... It's a heyday, and this is how it is, this is how it was, this is how it is. But I don't want to end on a, on a bad uh, news. This is the good news of the year. We were able to get with the UNESCO office in Beirut uh, the uh, Keeping It Modern grant for those who uh, are familiar with the preservation of modern architecture. There is this Getty grant, and I invite you, if you are connected to an institution or something like that, that wants to preserve a modern building, they are looking for projects. So they, are, they don't, don't have enough applications, or at least they don't have enough convincing applications. So please don't hesitate to tell anybody who wants to save a building in Portugal or elsewhere to apply for the Getty grant, Getty Foundation grant. It's called Keeping It Modern. So we were happy to get it with the UNESCO office, and uh, we are going to prepare a conservation management plan uh, for the uh, Oscar Niemeyer Tripoli Fair that hopefully will uh, be saved somehow. And this is uh, the end with the uh, uh, website and the uh, Facebook uh, and the uh, email. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry if I was long. <laughs> I was too long. One and a half hours. I took the whole hour, <laughs> one and a half hour? No. If, uh, if there are questions, I, w I wouldn't mind answering if it's... Uh, it took too much time. But we started there. Okay. Uh, the plan was to have the three of us here. There's a, a chair missing. So I open the floor to any questions that you might have. I um, encourage people to to address any questions that they have on, on, on the Arab world, architecture in general, even if it's uh, a more um, melancholic note or a more optimistic one, right? Uh, I think the, the slides that you showed made a very convincing case that what, what's being destroyed and what is being lost is international style and what is t uh, taking its place now is pseudo Lebanon or Arab style. But c could you um, suggest some reasons for why that is happening? And is it, is it to do with the, the patrons, to do with uh, corporate interests, or is it to do with the architects? Yes, uh, uh, it's a very good question because I think that the reasons for this happening are not the same everywhere. Uh, in some cases, for example, in the case of Lebanon, uh, the war had certainly something to do with it. There is this sort of nostalgia, because this is not hitting only architecture. Uh, the art production, as, as you saw in, uh, in what you have here in the collection, you know, this, the, the work of the Iraqis uh, in the 50s, 60s, and so on, and the work of the Lebanese artists at the time, were not particularly interested in representation or in any nostalgia of uh, landscape, or idyllic landscape of Lebanon and so on. But after the war, we found a lot of these. And that has to do with the fact that we felt, artists felt that there is something lost that they need to capture again. In architecture, it is more or less the same. Plus, uh, the, also what had happened in the meantime, which is that a lot of Lebanese engineers and architects had gone to the Gulf and returned with this sort of idea that, okay, Dubai and so on, we have the technology and so on, but we can give it a sort of local taste and that's easy to do uh, using the vocabulary here and there. So that's for the case of Lebanon. Uh, in, in other places, uh, speculation is also the same in Lebanon and elsewhere. Uh, when you have, for example, if you take the Carlton building, uh, it was not being demolished to be replaced by something historical, but it was demolished. Can you imagine that the site was, the, the hotel uh, and the land was sold for $40 million at a moment, then uh, sold to somebody 
at 80 million only a couple of years later. So this land cost $80 million before you demolish, which is costly, and before you build again. So imagine how much money the developer thinks and probably will make by paying $80 million before, you know, this is all an incident on the cost of the apartments, $80 million before you start. Still they are able to make it because they built huge apartments that can be bought by people either from the Gulf or elsewhere. And it, it creates some problems in cities like Beirut because uh, there are a lot of empty apartments. So you build a building stock and those who can buy them do not live there. So people who want to live in the city have to live outside and transportation. So this sort of problem beyond, of course the question is, is very important, the question of style and so on, but by merely demolishing and rebuilding again and changing the city fabric and so on, you're changing that sort of balance and you cannot uh, capture it anymore. So it's lost uh, almost forever. Uh, when you take uh, examples, uh, I mean, in Iraq, they have the same problems. I was invited there in 2013 for a conference on Le Corbusier and the stadium uh, that he, the gymnasium that he designed and so on. And uh, we went around the city and so on. It's, you know, uh, a patched up job, not all of it, of course, of alu alu alucobond, aluminum panels that we saw on the, uh, our stadium. Um, and uh, it has to do with uh, this idea that you can do something very quick, very flashy, and so on. So the idea of continuity with history, I tried to say it in the first, first slide. Uh, I very much believe that uh, Tafuri really coined it very well because it's not about how things look in design. It's about your attitude as a designer. What are you bringing to the table and to your mindset as you are designing? What are the arguments? And more often than not, I argue that if you don't think about identity, you will let it appear normally where it should. It will appear because of the building code. It will appear because of the desire of a client. It will appear because of the building construction technique or the economy of building or the time you have to produce it. Or everything that goes within the cooking of a building is more important than any statement you can start with. Uh, another argument of the I will give the, the floor to somebody else, but just a quick uh, to, to end. Another argument has to do with the digital making of architecture. This has a huge incidence on the, the quality of design, good or bad, but that's another issue. The materiality gets completely... Tectonics, materiality, all sorts of things. Fa quick, uh, quickness in producing. Um, thank you very much for this uh, extremely interesting presentation. Um, you, you mentioned the, um, the Haleji, the, the Gulf countries, and they're obviously having a very important influence at the moment on, on the evolution of Arab architecture because of different elements like funding and institutions. So I think those countries also might be divided between um, the ambition of only having iconic, um, highly commercial buildings, but you've also mentioned like Sharjah, where there is an ambition also to, to do a, a good work of documentation. So I would just like to ask you to, to maybe put a, a hat of Nostradamus and, and tell us how do, how do you foresee the next 20 years and are you optimistic about um, the direction that um, architecture in the Arab world if we might say so, is going to evolve. Yes. Um, of course, it will have a lot to do with uh, how the Arab world settles, because now it is in a big political mess. Uh, and, uh, of course, the reconstruction of Iraq, the reconstruction of Syria, will also set a, a direction in how to rebuild. Uh, I hope that they don't do the mistakes we did in Lebanon, by, you know, the tabula rasa and so on. Now, for the direction in architecture, uh, there is one problem that I didn't mention, but it has to be mentioned, especially speaking about the future, which is architectural education. Architectural education, you have now more and more schools of design and architecture opening everywhere. In the Arab world, you have a lot of the uh, sort of franchise of schools uh, with you know, German universities, Swiss, French, British, whatever. Uh, some are very good, but some are not good enough. And therefore, uh, you cannot, as before, uh, 
I don't like the word control education, but at least monitor in a certain way. And uh, so education is extremely important because if you educate uh, architects uh, to uh, only be interested every day in the uh, latest trend, which is what we are going uh, towards usually if you, when you, when as a professor you give a research, students to research something, of course they go to Google now, the fastest uh, thing. Uh, we used to spend, uh, I don't want to be like a dinosaur or uh, give lessons, but I have to state uh, m the, the facts. I mean, we used to spend hours and hours in libraries. And we used to even discover things by accident. Today you don't discover anything by accident on the web because you go to look for something. And if you don't find it, you go to look for it again somewhere else. So we used to discover things along the way. Uh, and uh, Ricardo mentioned the tactility of architecture, the tectonics, the, the, the physical quality. Uh, you learn this from uh, visiting architecture more than looking at it. Uh, we, we did not have a choice. We did not have the, the access to information that was digital. We had to either go to the books or visit the buildings, whether in the country or elsewhere. Uh, it's not to say that people don't move nowadays, but uh, there is this idea of the shortcut to the image, uh, and uh, I think this is uh, terrible for architecture everywhere, not only in, uh, in, the, in the Arab world. So my answer uh, in a nutshell is, uh, I'm not extremely optimistic. There are a few directions that are, I think, very good. Uh, it might be the opportunity for another presentation about... Uh, directions, uh, yeah, like so good, solid directions in the architecture of the Arab world. Some of it is good, modest architecture. Some of it is iconic, good architecture. Uh, but uh, in general, uh, the, the slope is not up as I see it so far. It's okay. Um, like public buildings and not buildings that belongs to citizens, because for it's too loud. Um, I come from Greece and um, we had like yeah this thing uh, after the war that you could as a citizen you have a building. Need it for the because it's live streamed. They need to hear you oh, to understand the question. So you could give your building that was like a neoclassical and they would give you back three new buildings. So you had an old building, you could do uh -huh. anything with it. So they would tell you, give it to us, and we will make three new buildings. So this was a big part of um, destroying our cultural heritage and heritage mm -hmm. and like the buildings. So I don't know if for you it was, most of the buildings were public, so they were demolished to be, I don't know, like um, something else, or just no. demolished, or no, no. people had buildings as well, and they okay. were Okay, in the, in the city center uh, reconstruction, supposed reconstruction, uh, most of the buildings were private buildings. They were not public buildings. Actually, we, we have very few public buildings. The, Lebanon is a country of the laissez-faire, of private enterprise. So the state, I will not say is absent, although now we've been without government for the last seven months, which is a, an issue in the country. Uh, but the private enterprise is, uh, is mostly there. So very few public buildings except for, let's say, some ministries. And you would be surprised to know that some ministries are rented within private buildings. Some ministries are into uh, apartment buildings, but rented for very expensive money. That's another issue. Uh, no, the, the issue of uh, public or private does not interfere in that, uh, in that sense. Uh, what interferes is uh, usually speculation. We are a small country, but everybody wants to be in Beirut, uh, and there, there are hardly uh, plots left. So this makes it very hard. Now there is a law that has been uh, more or less passed. Uh, um, it is a law that we have to be careful about and monitor, which is the right of air which means that if you have a heritage building and if you're allowed to build on top of it a certain amount of square meters, uh, you will be allowed to sell them to somebody who can go and build them somewhere else. Uh, which may be good to save the building, but it may mean that you are putting the problem somewhere else in another, it might not be a um, implementation problem as much as it could be a transportation problem, an infrastructure problem, and 
sometimes a political problem. Where would you put those square meters to build? In which area? Who will benefit from it? So then you, you enter another round of uh, suspicion. Uh, I always argue for something uh, which is to have a directorate for architecture. Uh, I'm all for free enterprise and so on, but I think that uh, it doesn't exist in the country. A directorate for architecture, there is a directorate for urban urbanism, but I think a directorate for architecture, whether it is placed in the Ministry of Culture or Public Works, doesn't matter. What it can do is more or less monitor what is happening, which is what we do, but as amateurs in a certain way, because we have no take on anything. Uh, and then if this law is passed, then that directorate would be, among other things, in charge of seeing what is happening and maybe correcting any wrongdoing. Because sometimes you do a law and it takes you 20 years to realize that this was the problem. So here at least you can, you can monitor. And for education, for example, that sort of directorate of architecture will not be in charge of controlling each and everything that you would teach in your university, but it will, for example, uh, entice programs to consider doing studios on heritage or adaptive reuse or uh, involve students in uh, more travel to visit buildings and so on. I mean, things that I think everybody would agree on but nobody is seems to be forced to do in a way or another. Uh, and it's not to say that somebody would be, because I know that sometimes if you create these sorts of institutions, you can be completely mistaken if those who are in charge of it do not know what to do and how to do it. Uh, because you would institutionalize something that is not good. But it shouldn't be the task of one person, it could be committees and discussions and, I mean, things that can make a difference coming from the part of the state, because I do believe also in some sort of uh, regulation, minimum regulation. about um, education that you mentioned previously. Would you say that there was a, a kind of golden age, any any sort of even short golden age of architectural education in the Arab world, in let's say the 60s or the 70s? Were these architects mainly trained in Europe and the US, or were they actually locally trained and and where was there a school of excellence, let's say, in in a, in a particular uh, spot where you know they converged? Um, would you like to elaborate a little bit on that? Yes, yes, I could speak uh, briefly. So I could speak so briefly about, about that. Truly, it's a chapter actually in my in my dissertation, uh, and uh, it is true that uh, many of the people who worked in the fifties and sixties were trained. Uh, Many were trained locally, some were trained abroad, but uh, many were trained as engineers or engineers architects. And in the, uh, in the programs of these schools, whether it's the American University of Beirut or the Université Saint-Joseph, which is a French uh, school, Jesuit uh, university, or later with the Académie Libanaise de Beaux-Arts, which is where I studied, it started, it's the first local school that started uh, in 43, the architecture program. Um, all of them, of course I studied later, I'm not that, uh, that old. Uh, uh, all these programs uh, were um, more or less mixed between engineering and architecture. So you had at first the, the filter of sound building. Yeah. Uh, uh, maybe, I don't know, you used the word rational or what did you use, the modern uh, style or whatever. But this came not only from uh, a desire to... Uh, use the vocabulary of modern architecture, uh, but it, it had a lot to do with uh, what we see here, for example, this idea of rational construction. And we were talking before about, if you look at the beams, for example, in this room, you see that uh, the beams are not on the same level. So the architect is telling us, or engineer, but the architect in this case, that you have a primary beam. And then the beam that is carried by it, or helped by it, is slightly higher. It has three or four centimeters recess. Huh? And the third one, it would have, I think there is a third one over there that has the third and the fourth and so on. So this is probably either the choice of the engineer or the discussion between the architect and engineer at the early stage of design. It's not a whim at last minute because this requires a lot of care. 
you have to really calculate the formwork and how do you get there and so on. You have to calculate if the thickness of the slab or the, or the beam will carry whatever you want. So this, for example, I mentioned before the idea of the digital, uh, the way you're talking about education because I can get back to this and link it to that. Uh, the engineers and architects, they used to work together. And they used to, if there is a competition, they sit together first day. It's not that the architect designed the whim and then the engineer comes to calculate it and try find a solution for it. Uh, so that makes a lot of synergy and a lot of uh, common sense or sense, let's say, to the designs. So many of these buildings, I, I think they are, they look good, but the other quality that is as important is that they make sense. Mm. And that making sense comes also from that. They are unique. For example, the, the I showed very quickly the, the building that is the printing press, which goes on the cover of the book that I hope one day will, will appear. That building, for example, is a printing press. Okay, so you have on the ground floor the printing press. Uh, you don't need to let the people see it. It has a a uh, stone uh, wall up to a certain level and light comes from between that stone and the, the ceiling. After that, you have a big, if you remember, a big grid uh, that is a sunscreen that protects all the, all the floors of the printing press, the offices, from the harsh sun. On the last floor, you have the apartment, the penthouse of the owner of the printing press. So the, the concrete claustra or uh, hollowed out things continues because he needs to protect his uh, living room from the harsh sun, but he has a terrace which doesn't exist below. So when you look at that and you start understanding and you look at the plans and you visit and everything, you see this makes so much sense. And it is playful and it is iconic and it will go on the cover of a book 50 years after and so on and so on. But everything in it made sense. So the idea of unique, being unique or being uh, special came within a sort of restraint or a sort of common sense and uh, in education, I think, probably because of the speed with which we have to teach, uh, there is little room to get that far in the discussion about the materials, materiality, you mentioned materiality and so on. So things are happening very far. Once there was this uh, friend of mine who teaches with us at the university, I used to teach at uh, AUB. Uh, he was always very fond of technology. He had the first smart car in the country, he was always at least one or two iPhones ahead of everyone. So we had the iPhone 3, we, had the, we were thinking about buying the first one or whatever. So he was giving this lecture, brilliant lecture about today's technologies and what you can do with them and how you produce architecture. And he took at some point his uh, phone from his pocket and said, with this I can order the materials from China and I, and I can hire my engineer from uh, Germany and send him the plans and the next day they are on my table and so on. And at the end I said, hey, stop, stop, please. There are things that we have to do slowly in life. And I meant the manushi, the breakfast. We have this uh, sort of pizza that we eat with oregano in the morning. This you cannot do in a microwave, I said. And I said, architecture is like that. You, you, it is like the manushi. It requires time. The time we spent, we used to spend to do a model, a physical model, hours to cut the cardboard. I, again, I'm a dinosaur, I'm sorry, it's, the, it's my age. But the time we used to spend to produce the model, try it on the topography that we actually had done as well and understand it from all the sides and so on and accept that failure is lost forever. The other issue in education is the question of scale. Today, there is a pinup. You ask a student, what's the size of the room? They hesitate before telling you that the room is, let's say, four by six because they zoomed in so much on their screen, in and out, that they forgot why did they do it that way in the first place? My generation, again, sorry for being a dinosaur, if you ask me to draw the Gulbenkian, if I know the plan, I can draw it to scale. You want it at one to 200, I'll draw it for you. You want it at 100, I'll draw it for you. Because distances and dimensions made sense. They were about how space is used and so on and so on. I'm not saying that this is all over the place, and I know I am doing a caricature, but if you add all these things together, then no wonder this is happening. Huh? Yeah. No wonder. Thank you very much. I, I, I really uh, recognize what you just said in our research of, 
of the Gulbenkian project in Baghdad because they were all about this pragmatism and this common sense, really. And they were really perfect examples of collaboration between architects and engineers. And we had someone in, in we, I mean, the foundation had someone in, in Baghdad, Ishan uh, Shirzad, who was an architect engineer himself. We in Portugal had someone who was Guimarães Lubato and Vaz Raposo. They both were the most architecture, architect engineers that I've uh, ever come across because they, they, were, they were engineers, but they had especially Vaz Raposo who was in charge of this communication with, with Baghdad and went there several times. He had a very strong architectural sensibility and culture. So on the, on the two sides, we, we never had this double degree in Portugal. We, you were either architect or an engineer. I mean, I'm, I'm talking in, in the 20th century, not before that. But, um, but you, you did have a lot of engineers that had an architectural culture and architects that had an understanding of materiality, structure, and, and a kind of, yes, openness, willingness to to collaborate from scratch, from the start, from day one. And what I see now in, in a lot of what you've shown and what we know of, of not only the Arab world, but what we see here in Portugal is a divorce mm -hmm. entirely between the architect and the engineer, mostly to do with, with misconceptions and, and really misunderstandings that start at school. Because I was taught that the engineer was the enemy, basically, when I went to the School of Architecture. So this starts, it's, you're indoctrinated. Yeah, it's, 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 not, it's not really, it's, it is dangerous and it has very, very melancholic and, and very negative repercussions that we see today. Of course, the very good architects know that they have to, to be in a very good relationship with the engineer from, from day one, but, but those that maybe in the 50s uh, built buildings such as many that you've shown were, were maybe not the, the, you know, the, the, the star architects of, of their time, but they had the sensibility, they, have the, they had the common sense and they had the, the pragmatism that I think, well, I'm, I'm a defendant of pragmatism myself in architecture, so I... I uh, anyway, I just wanted to say that I really, uh, uh, what you said really resonates with what we saw happening in this 15 year period between uh, 57 and 73 in, 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 Baghdad, in Iraq in general. And I think it was something of the times perhaps as well. I mean, this, this kind of pragmatism and, and, and common sense, it was something that was, um, that was of the time, of its time, maybe. So, okay. I don't know if there are more questions. I didn't want to hold you up any longer. Uh, one, two, two final notes, uh, or three final notes. Um, we will have two, two more uh, weekends, two more Saturdays of, of uh, tours of the exhibition for those who might be interested. We have the coming, the coming Saturday on the 19th, Patricia and myself are going to uh, do this uh, Conversation, uh, um, conversada, yeah, this kind of guided tour. Let's call it like that. Uh, uh, and and then on on uh, the twenty sixth, we have another tour uh, of of the of of the exhibition also coming. So these were the, the the two notes that I wanted to leave. And the final note to thank George very much to, for being here, and uh, and for. Um, for giving us this 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 talk today and opening our eyes to the to the to, the, to much more to the open to the to the Arab world and and the architecture of the Arab world. Thank you very much. Thank you for everyone for being. Here.